I think that part of what happens in moments of transition like this is that it's exciting to think about change and transition, but when you really sort of settle in and you start to ask a set of how-to questions, how am I going to do this, where am I going to go, when you start asking a practical set of questions, it gets kind of daunting. And today is really about creating a set of experiences and that will help you build a process to figure out how to make the journey from where you are to where you want to be. Specifically, I think that part of what happens is when we ask students five years out, what do you want your life to look like? Students can give us a lot of answers. But as we work that timetable back 18 months, three years, 12 months from now, what do you want your life to look like? That's when it starts to get sticky. And that's when I think you really need a process and a set of skills to really help you work that out. And I think that that's part of what today is about. So I want to say that I am really excited for where you are in your lives, groans aside. I think it's going to be great. I also want to say thank you to the Career Development Center staff for putting this together. They have really rethought this program and really carefully thought about a set of experiences to help you come out of today feeling equipped, more equipped. And maybe the way that you're going to feel equipped is by having additional questions, places that you can identify that I need more information, I need more experience, I need to know more. But that's part of what today is really designed for. So I hope you have a great day. Congratulations from where I sit reading data and meeting students and meeting young alumni. I know that you guys are going to go do great things. But today is about how you get there. So congratulations. Welcome to your last semester at Trinity College. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to the Director of Career Development, Joe Catrino. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Bazell. Appreciate it. How's everybody doing? All right? Good? All right. We used to start this a lot earlier, but the timing, I think, is good. Everybody's a little bit more awake, right? 11 o'clock start is good. Uh, so I'm Joe Catrino. I'm the Director of Career Development here, um, and I'm excited to welcome you to Bantams and Beyond. Um, as uh, Dean Bazil alluded, we have rethought the structure of today and the programming that uh, comes with it, and so we're really excited for what this, uh, this event will be. Um, before we get to that, there's a few people in the room I'd like to thank uh, specifically uh, from Career Development and acknowledge all the work, uh, time, and um, collaboration that went through to get this event to where it is uh, today. Uh, so first, uh, Emily Merritt, if you could just wave, hello, Emily over there. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> uh, Phyllis Mensa, is Phyllis here? I think she was working on her presentation. Yeah? No? Okay. She's waving wherever she is. Um, Heather Hodge, I think, is still doing registration. There she is. Hi, Heather. <laughs> um, Severin Sant, Sev. Okay. Uh, Trisha Raytai in the back. Okay. Tracy Evans Moyer over there. And Kara McDonald, who's right there. Uh, <laughs> so, those are the wonderful people that put this event together. So, let's give them all a big round of applause. So in just a few minutes, uh, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, but before we do that, if you all could just take a look at your agendas, uh, I'd like to go through some logistics, some uh, nuts and bolts uh, for today, uh, just to make sure everybody's feeling like they're in the know as to how this day is structured. Um, so if you take a look, uh, we're going to have the keynote uh, speaker right after this, and then at approximately 1210, we're going to uh, br do breakout sessions. Uh, there will be three breakout sessions, as you can see, starting at 1210 that go to 1240. Um, there are three. Um, if you have a first choice, um, all of the rooms should be equipped to, to seat all of us. Um, but if you happen to go to your first, you know, your first choice and that room looks filled, go to your second choice because if you take a look down further at 1250 to 120, you'll have an opportunity to go back to that first choice. So you will be able to do two of those three sessions um, in the morning session, okay? And, and we're going to be using um, the terrace rooms, which are right around the corner here, uh, Rimberg Lounge, which is right across the hall, and then the Alumni Lounge, which is um, that way in the back of the room. 
Uh, after that, we're going to have a fajita lunch um, right back in this room here. Uh, lunch will be set up in the back there. Um, and then shortly after that, I'm going to be back on the stage because uh, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of the new Bantam Career Network, which we're excited to launch in the coming weeks. Um, so we're going to do that, um, and I'll, I'll run through that in a shortly. And then we'll uh, do a couple more breakout sessions, again, keeping the same uh, thought process in mind is, you know, if the first session you want to go to is full, go to your second choice and then try your first choice again because we should have enough seating for, for you to see two of those three sessions. Uh, and then uh, at 4.20, um, you will uh, meet with some young professionals who are uh, just recently out of, of Trinity who will be able to share their experiences with you in roundtable discussions. And then we're going to have a networking event with some hors d'oeuvres. You'll get some drink tickets and you'll be able to network with some other alums. Uh, so today is, is, is chock full of uh, lots of really good information and content uh, that you know, we think is relevant to you that can help you uh, make those next steps uh, to uh, your life beyond uh, Trinity College. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome Brian McBride, uh, class of 1988. Uh, Brian is the CEO and founder of Burst. He's the first African-American to be elected class president at Trinity and was voted an All-American defenseman for Trinity's championship hockey team. Brian has over 20 years of experience as an executive, an entrepreneur, and an investor. So I'd like you all to welcome Brian McBride. Good morning. And thank you for having me. Um, I recognize some faces here. Um, who heard me when they were sophomores? Was anyone? A couple of people? Okay. Or you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's always fun to come back. It's always uh, fun to be here. And at this juncture of your, of your career here at Trinity, it's, uh, it's especially poignant, I think. And I, I'll start off with this very simple question. I'll try and make this interactive and make it a conversation but I'm going to try and um, frame some things for you as you approach the nuts and bolts this afternoon. I did look at the agenda, and um, I will go through a few nuts and bolts about this point uh, in your lives, but this conversation, some of it's going to be just philosophy and how to look and how to think about what you're about to, to uh, undertake. Okay? Um, and I'll start with a simple question. Who here has ever felt overwhelmed? I think that's unanimous, pretty sure it is. And, that, and that's for good reason, right? The, um, the life changes that are literally right in front of you are complex. There's a lot going on. You've just gone through four years of, am I okay? Of roller coasters and pressure of grades and tests and papers and expensive, you've got your own expectations, your parents have their own expectations, and I especially know that because some of you may know my son, know my son Jake, uh, who's a junior here now, and um, just left for Paris three days ago, so he's on a semester abroad. So I'm living, it, I'm living it with you and with your parents as well, okay, so it's especially poignant for me as well. So there's, there's all these expectations right now about the job search, about your next, or about graduate school, or where you're headed. And it's overwhelming. It's frankly just, it's a lot. And I understand that, everybody understands it, and it's how you face that, and it's how you deal with it. And as, uh, as the Dean said, um, how you put in place a process to think about that and to go after the, the goal of a transition that makes you feel great. And a lot of that comes from this crazy dynamic and this calculus around the job search, right, or around your next step. And on one side of that calculus are four dreaded words that I want to put out there and I want you to think about, okay, in a different way than people currently think about them. And those four words, I still hear them throughout my career. I've heard them from the time I was in your seat, and I've heard them, and I hear them until now. When people say to you, what do you do? What do you do? It's a loaded question. With it comes expectation of, oh, I've got to impress this person. They're going to think I'm less than, or they're going to think I'm not smart, or they're going to think, you know, you've got this kind of inner, internal angst of what do you do, and you've got to come up with this great answer at the cocktail party or at the Thanksgiving dinner table or wherever. 
right? I try not to ask it of people because it, it comes with all kinds of baggage. And in that is a definition of, a definition of success inside of it, the, of people's expectations and of your own expectations. What do you do? So that's one side of this equation. On the other side of the equation is the pull to be able to give this, this interesting answer or this answer that is going to satisfy them, satisfy yourself. And I'm telling you right now, it's a curse. It's a trap and it's a curse, okay? That definition of success leads lots of people to do something that I find unacceptable. And I'll get to that in a second. But first I'll start with some good news, a big dose of truth and some good news. What you've done over the last three and a half years is you've built a muscle that allows you to take lots of information, condense it, analyze it, and be able to plot a path forward. You've developed a muscle, an intellectual muscle. This is the heart of a liberal arts education, and it's valuable. And the result of that is, this is the good news, I have never met a Trinity graduate in my 31 years, which is frightening since I graduated, I've never met a Trinity graduate who doesn't have a job. You're all going to get jobs. That's the good news, okay? You're going to end up, you're going to end up paying your bills and going on and getting a job. What I'm here to talk about is whether it's a job that you tolerate or whether it's a job that you love. And it's a job that fulfills you. There's only about, depending on the, the polls that you look at, anywhere from 70 to 85% of people unfortunately hate their jobs. They don't love what they do. And that's just, to me, unacceptable. And that comes from, what do you do? And it pulls you in this direction like a magnet to conform and be able to give an answer to that question and to succumb to, what do you do? Okay, to what other people want you to do, what other people's expectations are, your parents, and frankly, your own expectations in, in, in internalizing that question, because so much of our self-worth and so much of who we are is wrapped up in what do you do, okay? Don't fall for it. Don't, don't become victim to that, okay? So what I want to talk about is being part of that, let's say it's 85%, being part of that 15% who flat out loves what they do. Some people come out and say, hey, I, I want to make money. Everyone needs to sustain and survive and make money and be able to do what they do. I'm not diminishing the importance of making money. But as an end-all, be-all, I found it a vacuous path. I've made lots of money. I've lost money. I, I, right? It's not what feeds me. It's not what feeds my soul. It's not why I get out of bed. And I know lots of people who go down that path hard and fast, and they quickly figure out after they've accumulated a lot of wealth, it's not what feeds them either. If you, if you look at the surveys as to what is the reason, what motivates people at work, money's about fourth on the list. So what are the top three? Why are they doing it, right? Why are they going to this job um, every day? It's not money. And if it is money, that quickly fades. Okay? So be aware of that as you're, if you're thinking, all I want to do is chase money. Be aware of that. It's important, but it's not the end-all, be-all, and it will leave you feeling probably pretty empty. Okay, I'm not speaking for everyone. Some people, that may be their driver, and more power, hallelujah, go get it. It's not what feeds me. And it's not what feeds a lot of my, my colleagues. As I said, I've been out of Trinity now for 30-some years. I have not gone a month in that time where I haven't talked to someone that I went to Trinity College with. Think about that. That's pretty crazy. And I'm not like this hyper connected guy. I do enjoy that, but the richness, a big chunk of the richness of my life, you guys look around. This is it. It's the people that you went to school with. It's the people you love. It's the people that you've spent all kinds of experiences with here, starting here and onward. Okay? The wealth, big chunk of the wealth of my life is seeing my classmates on a weekly basis when I live in Boston and New York. And I still see them and we still connect and we still do lots of things together. Okay? So that that leads to an acronym that I think is at the core of, of what you're looking for, the secret. It's people in terms of your job. It's people, it's learning, and it's purpose. Okay? 
you can always use that as a compass. If you're not sure where you're going, where you're, how you're feeling, are you working with people that you love? Are you working with people that you feel proud of to be part of what they're doing? Are you learning? Because if you stop learning, it gets really hard really fast. Okay? And, do you, and most importantly, do you have purpose? I call it the get out of bed test. When you, when you get out of bed, are you excited to be going to do what you're going to do? If you're not, you're on the wrong side of the equation. You're on the wrong side of the calculus. And it's time to reevaluate and it's time to understand what leads you to the right people, to learning, and to the right purpose. Okay? So my career, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, my, my background by way of showing you something that I'm working on now because it doesn't end. Right? I've been at school a long time, but it doesn't end. And you have to keep, you have to keep finding new ways to, to realize that purpose. The great, one of the greatest compliments I've ever, I've ever received, Jake has a 15-year-old sister named Mari. She's my daughter. She's 15, Mari McBride. And she's wise beyond her years. Hopefully someday she'll be here too. We'll see. But she asked me when she was 12 years old, she says, so dad, you know, we live in a nice place in Lexington, Massachusetts, and, you know, we go on trips and do lots of fun stuff. So she's a smart kid. She's 12 years old, three years ago. She says to me, dad, what do you do? You know, she couldn't quite figure it out. I'm an entrepreneur. I build businesses. I started off after, after Trinity. I went to the Kennedy School at Harvard. I got out. I worked in finance and real estate. Absolutely hated it. Um, and I knew that I wanted to work in sports. That's what drove me, and that's what still drives me to this day, is sports. That's, I've been working at it for a long time and in that field for a long time. So I navigated and figured out my way to get there. And I'll give you some of the tactics on, on how, that, how that happens. So I navigated to get there. And then after that, um, uh, I, worked, I worked for the National Hockey League as vice president of business development for 10 years. Okay? A gentleman named Gary Bettman um, he's a commissioner, and he hired me. I was his seventh hire. And not a lot of black hockey players. So I, didn't, I wasn't hired for that reason, but I felt compelled to say, you know what, I'm in this place. I've got to make a difference. I've got to change. I've got to open this game and this opportunity for kids of color, not just black kids, but kids, all kids, okay, men and women. So I set, I set on that mission literally 25 years ago. And I tell you that because I'm going to show you, show you something. So, so back shortly. So back to Mari. Um, I then, after, after the NHL, I said, one thing that I figured out was I'm not good in big companies. I act up. I, I just hate corporate politics. I, I get in a lot of trouble when I'm in a company more than 20 people because I start to, I, I want to I be in charge, for one, um, and I want to do things my way, and I want to set my rules, and, and I want to work at my pace and do all the things that I do. So... I better, that's better for me if, I'm in, if, if I build my own companies. So I'm on, my, I'm on my eighth company now. I've built lots of startups over the years, all at the intersection of sports and technology. That's my fit, being in charge of what I do. Um, and the other thing, frankly, that, um, that I figured out when I worked for big companies, and again, I'm going to be very frank, okay? I hate making rich guys richer. I wanted that to go to my kids and my wife and to me and be able to set my own terms. I worked like crazy, and I wanted to benefit from that. My dad told me when I was really little, he said, there's two types of people, people who own things and people who work for them. I didn't understand it until later. I really understood it about 10 years out of school, and I made that change because I wanted to own what I did. So I've owned what I've done, and that's what Mari was confused about in that she's seen that as an entrepreneur I'm running around doing all these different things. I've sold companies, built and sold companies to Sports Illustrated, to, um, um, to ESPN. We've, we've had a great run. We've had a really good run. We've got the same investors. My lead investor is um, a Trinity grad. He's the chairman of, of, I met him when I was in your seat. I was literally a senior second semester when I met this gentleman. And to this day, he is 31 years later, he's the chairman of my board. And I've done every deal I've done, he's been involved. He's opened. Three quarters of my contact base comes from this one guy who's a Trinity alum. It's incredible. So she watched all this stuff happen, all these companies being built, and I'm running around like a maniac. And I explained that to her, and she says, 
you're an inventor. I was like, whoa. I mean, it could knock me over. I never, ever thought of myself as an inventor. And I'm not there, you know, writing code or, you know, building hardware, but I, I invent stuff. I have to figure stuff out when there's no roadmap, there's no path, and it's solve it. Figure it out, right? And that's what I've instilled in, I've done my best to instill in my kids. So my daughter calling me an inventor made me really step back and think, how's that happened? Or, you know, how am I lucky enough to do that? And the reason that I'm lucky enough to do that is that I've been able to reinvent myself and not let anyone else define me. And I urge you to do the same, okay? Don't let anyone else define your success. What do you do? Bullshit. Don't do it, okay? You decide. It's very, very personal. And that could be opening a bakery. That could be inner city gardening. That could be anything that you set your mind to, okay? That you say, this is what I'm going to do. And if you start somewhere, it's not static. You can change it. You can do something different. You can re that's that muscle, that little liberal arts education muscle that you've developed. It doesn't go away. It just gets stronger and stronger and better and better and better if you keep learning, if you work with the right people, and if you have purpose. If you don't have those things, I find at least that you go sideways. So one of the things that I started to work at when I was at the NHL I wanted to give kids of color, I'm going to use my own examples, take, take from it what you will. But again, this is my purpose, and this is one of the things that defines me, and it started 26, 27 years ago, and I'm going to catch you up to speed on something that I'm working with. It's so relevant today, literally happening today, okay, after this, after this talk. It's crazy. I hope, it, I hope it's meaningful, as meaningful to you as it is to me. So when I was a little kid, I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada. That's where the hockey comes from. They don't let you leave unless you play hockey. They don't give a shit what color you are, okay? You chase pucks and you do what you do. And that's what I did. And was lucky enough to play here for great teams and great teammates. And so when I got to the NHL, I wanted other kids of color to have that experience, right? And the same, not just because I love hockey, but it's just because kids, all kids should have equal opportunity to do all kinds of things, right? And that's what, um, that's what I did. So I, I started something called, um, at the time it was called uh, the NHL's Hockey Diversity, it was called the Diversity Task Force in Hockey. So we started programs, and this wasn't part of my job description, I just felt very strongly that we needed to do it. Um, we started programs in inner cities and in barrios and reservations to give boys and girls opportunity to play, right? The, the, Climb the hurdles of equipment, ice time, all the stuff that makes hockey really expensive. And I knew as a little kid that there was a guy named, anyone know, and I've got, I'll, I'll give you something if you know this. Anyone know who the first black player was in the National Hockey League? Anyone else? No? What year? <laughs> What's your name? Joe, Joe well done. Um, that's exactly right. You know what date it was? I, I would have been, I would have said, holy shit, Joe. <laughs> I'm already blown away. But, okay, so, so yes, that's exactly right. In 1958, he became the first black player in the NHL, and it was 61 years ago today. Like, literally, today, okay? And I knew that when I was 10, 11 years old, and I was angry with him because I wanted to be the first black hockey player in the NHL. And, but I got over it. And um, so Willie played, Willie played 1958 to 61 for the Bruins, up and down, you know, he played a total of 45 games. He wasn't Jackie Robinson, right? He was up and down. There were only six teams in the National Hockey League. He was out of the league by 61, but he went on to play until 1980. The guy played 21 years of pro hockey. as one of few, very few black players, and he had one eye. Now I saw everyone look up. Holy shit. Yeah, he had one eye, okay? This guy was so determined and so incredible at what he did that he figured out a way to play professional hockey with one eye as one of very few black players in a predominantly white sport. So he retires in 1980. He works as a security guard. He runs fast food restaurants. He is, works, works construction. He's got a young family to feed. And he does it. He lives up to his responsibility and he does it. 
I call him in 1996. I tell him who I am and what I want to do, and I want to hire him to travel to all of these programs. And basically, and I met him, and I was blown away by him. That experience when he was out of hockey from 80 to 96, not bitter, not angry, not, you know, PO'd because all these guys are making all this money and he didn't. Willie has, Willie is, so I hire him in 96, and I'll get to that. I hire him in 96 at 60 years of age when I hired him. He's now 83. He's still doing it. He's still going. Crazy, right? So he, um, he is this earnest, humble, amazing guy who now has impacted the lives of hundreds of thousands of kids by saying, you can have an opportunity, you can do this, you, I did it, you can do it too. The reason I'm telling you all this is purpose. I left the NHL 19 years ago. I've been doing, building my own businesses, doing my own thing, but I still work with this guy today. And in the last year especially, I've been really working closely with him. Right? That purpose has been a thread through everything else, no matter what I was getting paid for, that still drives me. That's important to me because this guy, through what he's gone through, everything that he's done, and it's been hard, really, really hard for him, right, to kind of keep going and persevere and be a pioneer and overcome all of this garbage and all of this stuff over so many years that he had a chance to impact. He now has a chance. To, he's impacted hundreds of thousands, millions of kids, millions of people. That's going to be his legacy, right? And to be able to facilitate that and help that in some small way, and I'm doing that with great people. I still learn every day when I do it. That's my bedrock. That's my purpose. And I still do it today. Okay. So a year ago, just to catch up to speed on this and show you something cool, a year ago, Willie invite a year ago today, Willie invited us to the 60th anniversary of his first game in the NHL at the Boston Garden. And I um, sat with the commissioner, we were in a box, it was all cool and everything. This, I've been gone for the NHL for 18 years, right? But I maintained the friendships and whatnot. And I said to the commissioner, this is crazy. We've got to get Willie in the Hall of Fame. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? He said, you're right. I can't lobby or anything. It's not my role, but you're right. What do you need? So we quietly set about getting Willie O'Ree into the Hockey Hall of Fame. He got in in November. That fills me, right? Moreover, I have a place in New York City, and I'm sitting on the brownstone in New York City, and I'm sitting on my stoop. My next-door neighbor walks by, brilliant documentarian, filmmaker, investigative journalist. Hey, how you doing, Brian? Hey, Lawrence, how are you? We start talking, and I tell her what I just told you, and she looks at me, and she says, we have to make this movie right now. I was like, you're right, we do. So, starting last February... We raised, very quickly, we raised about half a million dollars, and we set out to tell Willie's story. I'll stop there for a second. Oops. I'll stop there and show you the trailer. In terms of this business of being the Jackie Robinson of hockey, have you had any troubles? Willie O'Ree of the Boston Bruins is the first Negro to play in the National Hockey League. Sixty years ago, Willie O'Ree broke the color barrier in professional hockey. He changed the game forever. Why don't we have Willie O'Ree in the Hockey Hall of Fame? I had my opportunity because of people like Willie O'Ree. He was blind in one eye. I played with a lot of guys who weren't very good who had two eyes. <laughs> you know, you'd be sitting in the penalty box and you'd hear the racial slurs. Someone called me an N-word on the ice. I don't stand for that. Willie is a hero. He's a hockey hero. That, that's the trailer to a documentary that we've done over the last 10 months. I'll show you one other clip in, in one moment um, that we've just poured our hearts and souls into. Find that thread. Find that purpose for yourself. It, it, it goes way beyond it may be your job. It may be outside of your job. But find that stuff that fills you, right? One, one more clip. This is, um, I'll set it up. This is a month ago, three weeks ago, okay? Three weeks ago, and you'll, you'll see who it is. This is towards the end, excuse me, the end of the film. Um, here we go. I feel cold here coming in here somewhere. Yes, thank you. 
<laughs> Frederick is not gone. <laughs> I get cold when I open the fridge. I have to stand sideways. Shoo! Woo! <laughs> nice to see some snow go again. I'm back on the road in uh, Ottawa, Canada. I came to uh, visit the uh, Prime Minister and I'm going to visit some boys and girls this afternoon and looking forward to it. Played with the straight blade until a little later on, and we started to curve the blades a little bit. But this was, this was it, straight well, blade. Well, can I get you to sign this? I certainly. It'd be by my pleasure. Here or here would be great. Well, right down here. Okay. And uh, would you like Prime Minister? I think Justin. We're, Justin? We're, we're, we're friends here. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. You're so welcome. <laughs> could not have imagined when he was running a fast food restaurant, when he was managing a fast food restaurant, that that's where he'd be years later. And that I've had some small part in that, again, purpose. That's what, that's what fills me. So to get there, and, and the, the payoff to all of this is um, I'm literally um, this afternoon negotiating with Netflix to sell that to them. I don't know how much money I'm going to get. I don't care. I just want people to see it and understand my friend's story. That's the important part, right? So you get what I'm talking about. I, I can't say it enough. Work for purpose, right? That's, that's success. That defines who you are, not what you do, okay? All right, so to do that and to get there, um, you, the two gentlemen in the back who raised their hands, I apologize, you've heard some of this before, I'm going to tell you a quick story about an intern I had. And, and you're going to hopefully get full-time work. Some of you may be interns. There's a gentleman named Michael Tusiani. When I was at the NHL, he went to St. Mike's in, um, in Vermont. And, you know, he, the internship, there were 50 people who applied for it. And, you know, Harvard, Yale, MIT, crazy, just unbelievable. Trinity Wesleyan, this kid from St. Mike's got the job to beat all of these you know, supposedly smarter people. And at one point, I thought Michael was sleeping in the office because I got I get in early. I get in at like 6.30, and I often leave late at like 8. He was there before me, and he left later than I did. So I swore to God the kid was sleeping in the office. And I told him, don't sleep in the office. He's like, no, no, I'm not. And he wasn't. I, I found out later. Fast forward 15 years later, and today what he does, um, and he's had the job for a while now, He's senior vice president of marketing for the New York Yankees. That's what he does now. Just because of work ethic, because he just figured it out. So I tell you about him because he, he um, called me three years ago. And he said, hey, I've got an, I've got an opening, entry-level person, coming out of a good school, hopefully. I've got an opening. And I'm sorry for torturing sports analogies, but it's all I know. So you have to bear with me on my stories. But he, um, I've got an opening, and I want to hire someone. So what Michael was doing there in the job process, and I'm going to just get to the nuts and bolts of some of the things you can do to get you where you want to go, using that liberal arts education and that intellectual muscle you've built. Okay? And at the heart of it is control what you can control. Because there's so much stuff that you cannot control. Somebody's going to be faster, smarter, better looking, all of that stuff. But you can control the stuff that matters to you. Okay? and it helps you get where you want to go. So Michael calls me and he says, I got an entry level position. It's behind the scenes. It took him three years to get that position, okay, to fill it. And um, he had to fight with 
you know, his boss is, hey, I need someone, I need someone. No, 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 we don't have the budget, we don't have the budget. He finally gets it. So he made phone calls to three people, all mentors of his, and said, do you know anyone? So we all, so I said, yeah, I've got three names for you. So three of us sent him names, so now he's got a pool of nine people, right? HR comes in, and they've got another 30 people, right? And so on, to the point where there's like 50 people applying for this one job. Okay, in, in sports, there's just a ton of resumes, a ton of competition, but take it to finance, take it to medicine, take it wherever you want, it's going to be the same for you, and you're fighting for that one job. And in this room at Bowdoin and Bates and everywhere else, people are doing the same thing as we are right now, okay? So it's competitive, it is, I'm not going to lie to you, it's competitive, and you've got to work hard to figure it out. So Michael's looking for this one spot, he's got a pool of 50 people, and this is how it works, this is how it winnows down. And I'm going to tell you to write down a couple of things that are really important. 25 of those 50 people, they will screw up. They will not have their resumes ready, or they will, the resumes won't be perfect. They won't have a cover letter. They'll show up late. They won't be dressed appropriately. They'll eliminate themselves before it even begins. Crazy. 50% of the pool, gone. Now you're down to 25 people for this one job. Okay? So the basics. And you guys, the career, the career services... Uh, Department of Trinity is, I mean, it's exceptional. It's exceptional. That resource is there for you for a reason. It's part of the big, the reason that I write these crazy checks to go to Trinity College is because of those guys. That's part of it, okay? Use them. Use them. If you don't use them, you'll end up being the 25 that get cut right away. Just on basic stuff, right? And, it, and it's, you know, it's the stuff like, what's your greatest weakness? What's your greatest strength? That's the easy stuff, guys, okay? If you don't have that nailed down, you're at a disadvantage. They will make sure you've got that stuff nailed down. And be on time. Be on time. Show up with something. This is a pet peeve, but it's really important. When you go to an interview, what's the one thing? I'm going to get a little. What's the one thing? One of the key things that you need. What's your name? I'm sorry. Chandler. Chandler. What, what do you have to do when you go to an interview? Prepare. Prepare, yes. I'll get to that in a second, but there's... What should you bring with you? A resume. Bring a resume. Chandler, front of the class, awesome. Um, bring a resume. And, and not just one resume, how many resumes? Bring 10. I've been in situations where you walk into a room and somebody's like, wow, you're great. You're wonderful. I want to introduce you to seven other people in our company. Oh, could you print off a copy of my resume for me? Oh, no, I happen to have five other copies or seven or ten other copies. You have half an hour to make that impression. You have half an hour to show them that you're the one person out of those 25 that they need to hire. Okay? You come in through a Trinity alumnus or somebody else, what I call getting blessed. Right? Those of, of that whole pool, those, what's the worst thing to, that can happen to Michael? Got you. Uh, Emma. Okay, Emma, what's the worst thing that can happen to Michael in this, in, this, in this scenario here? Throughout this whole process, he narrows it from 50 to 1, chooses the 1. What's the worst thing that can happen to, happen to him? Almost. Think of it, he hires, if that person's not the right person, what's the worst thing that can happen? That's okay, that's okay. He... He picks the wrong person. Right? You said it in a roundabout way. He, he picks the wrong person. That McBride guy you hired, he's a jackass, his boss says to him as he's walking down the hall. He's like, oh, God, I just went through all of that, and that guy's a clown. i got to start over again. It costs Michael political capital inside. He looks bad for hiring the wrong person. That's the worst thing that can happen to him. So you have to assure to him, you have to assure him, excuse me, that you're the right person. You've got half an hour to do that. So you're down to 25, right? You go in, you talk to the HR people, you've got your resume, bring something to write with. You cannot remember everything that's being said in a meeting. That's why all those crazy notes you've been taking for four years, why am I taking notes? This is why. Write, bring something to write with. If somebody shows up in my office without a resume or something to write with, I'm nice to them, but the, the interview is effectively over. They're not prepared. And that says to me in that half an hour, this person's not going to be prepared. It's done, right? They'll be nice to you because they're a turn of the alum or whatever, but the interview's over. 
Okay? Bring, something, bring your resumes, 10 of them, bring something to write with. Okay? Critically important. So those are, those are just the beginnings. So then, um, who said be prepared? Chandler said be prepared. So what that means, I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. What's your name? Teddy. Teddy? Yeah. Okay. Be prepared, okay? Be prepared in that you do not ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? If you know the person went to Princeton and played field hockey, you're going to, in a roundabout way, you're going to say, so did you enjoy your field hockey experience at Princeton? What does that say to them, Teddy? Did your homework. Did your homework. You prepared. And you're showing them in that half an hour, I prepare for stuff. I brought what I need. I prepare for stuff. I'm ready for this. Right? So you have shown them, this kid knows that I went to Princeton and played field hockey. Holy smokes. That's amazing. Okay, so that, like, those are all reassurances that, that the person's good. So this is a true story. Michael gets it down to now five people. And I sent a woman who was an intern for me at Boston College. She's a rock star. She was really great. She was one of the people that comes blessed. And he puts those people in higher regard and in a higher pecking order than the people that just came in through the Internet or from anywhere else because he knows I'm not going to send them jokers because that's a reflection on my political capital. Right? So he's, he knows that I've sent those three, the people that come from those three mentors, they get a special look. They just do. Subconsciously or not, they get a special look because it's come from a friend who, tr who they trust. That's why he called me and asked me. Right? So I send this woman from BC and she, um, she blows his doors off. I had the same conversation with her. She, she does terrifically well. And what she says, what I trained her to say, and I'm going to tell you, is the secret to getting any job you want. Write this down. And you only use this if you know in your heart, in your soul, that you want to be there. I'm going to preface it. You are making a choice too. It's not just them asking. You're not there begging them for a job. Why is that? Because you're going to get a job, right? You're all going to get jobs. You're going to find jobs. So you don't have to settle. You don't settle. Who here is going to settle on who they marry? If I see one hand, I'm going to come over and kick you. <laughs> don't settle. Don't settle for it. Don't settle for the what do you do. Pulls you like a magnet towards, oh, I've got to be able to say something. I'm going to settle, and I'm going to be part of the 85% that doesn't love what they do. Are we going to do that? Are we going to do that? Please tell me no. We're not going to do that. You're going to be part of the 15% who loves what they do, right? You're kind of looking at me like, this guy's full of shit. <laughs> I'm not, really. <laughs> All right? So don't settle. You can't settle, right? So, so you, you now have, you've now at the point where you know, you know that you like this job. You like this person. And remember, what's that first? The first thing of, of the PLP, right? Purpose and learning of the others. What's the other one? People, right? Do I want to work with this person? Who's, who here has seen The Office? The show The Office. Pretty funny, right? You don't want to work there. <laughs> okay, that's where, that's where a lot of America works. And it sucks. It sucks. It's not fun to go in there. If you had to get up every morning and go see Steve Carroll, ugh, right? That'll eat, your, that'll eat you from the inside out. It's awful. You can't do that, right? So, so Carly's going in. She knows what she's doing. She knows the answers to the questions she's going to ask. Where's Danielle? Where's Danielle Bebo? Is she here? No? <laughs> she's like, oh, God, that's creepy and weird. <laughs> so, Danielle, tell me about your internship at City last summer. Um, I worked in sales and training. We did three rotations. It was, it was great, obviously, right? And the reason I know it was great is because she just got a job offer. Right? That was getting really weird, right? <laughs> I prepared to come see you. And I know something about others as well that I may embarrass shortly. But I prepared. I'm busy. I got a lot of shit going on. I got kids. I, ah, madness, right? But I made sure that I took the time to understand what's, what some of you are doing. And congratulations, by the way. That's awesome. Um, right? So... So that, that's an easy thing, and that's what Carly did. She prepared. She ends up getting the job, right? Because what's at stake there for Michael is not being embarrassed, right? 
right? Not, right? He doesn't want to be embarrassed and have somebody go, oh, she's a joker. And he needs to know, he needs to know that the person has his backside covered. So fast forward six months into this job, and he's presenting to everyone at Major League Baseball. Carly's doing the presentation. His wife goes into labor the night before. He calls Carly, and he says, you're doing the presentation. She's six months out of BC, and she's in front of all the owners of Major League Baseball. That's what's at stake, guys. He's got to make sure he's got the right person to do that. That's on his side. On her side, she's connected with him. She liked him. And when she knows, right, because the assets in that business go up and down in the elevators, when she knows, when she's sure that she wants to get up, he's not Steve Carroll, she wants to get up in the morning and see this guy, that's when she says this. Write this down. I have been an asset. to every organization to which I have belonged, period. If you, not the New York Yankees, Acme Widgets, you, because it's about him or her, the person, the woman sitting on the other side of that desk who's interviewing you, who's got to make sure that you, something happens, you got them covered. And you're going to be prepared, you're going to do your homework, all that stuff. If you give me the opportunity, I will do the same for you. That's it. If they don't understand what you have just given them, then you do not want to work there. That's not spite or anything. That means they don't get it. You're saying, I'm in. I'm all in. You got me. I'm going to cover your butt. I'm going to, make, I'm going to work like a maniac. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to bring everything that I got at Trinity College and in other places, and I'm going to bring it for you with passion and purpose. If they don't get that, you don't want to be there. Okay? So, Carly um, got the job, and she now, she now runs sponsorship for the Philadelphia Eagles. Just climbing, climbing, right? Because she figured it out. So, that, that process of controlling what you can control, knowing the questions that you're going to ask, knowing, you know, doing a little bit of homework, didn't take me a lot of time to figure out, you know, Danielle's path and her success and what she's been through. And, you know, there's others that, that are in this room that I did a little bit of homework on to, to just illustrate that that's what you have to do. You don't go in there. You, you know, I'm a people person. It's not going to get you where you want to go. Right? That, that's not it. That's not the solution. That's not the answer. Okay? So, <clears throat> let me grab a drink here real quick. Now you're, you're, I just want to remember one, one last thing here. As I said earlier, you're not static, right? You're not static. It doesn't stop. You keep morphing, you keep moving. I could not have told you 30 years ago, 10 years ago, Five years ago that I was going to be working on this film as part of my heart and soul and negotiating with Netflix this afternoon. Uh, it, was not a, it wasn't on my radar 366 days ago. It wasn't. But now it is. And I'm really filled by it. And it's a great thing that I cherish. And it came back. It's a, it's a direct line back to one person. A little, little sentimental here. And that's my mom. Okay? It comes from my mom. You guys will be in a similar spot at some point soon. My mom was incredibly young when she had me. Um, the day that I graduated from Trinity College, I, came, I became the first person to graduate from college in my family. My mom was, you know, was, my mom was 15 years old when she had me. Okay? Didn't just poor, poor, poor part of Chicago. Um, I've been lucky to do all the stuff that I've talked about. My mom did something even more important for my family. And that is she broke the cycle of poverty in my family. Who here knows Jake? Anyone? Jake's here because of her. I helped, but he's here because of her. And she said something to me. My earliest memories, my earliest memories as a kid, really little kid. And remember, she was, she told me this. Is there anyone here who's not 20 yet? 
okay? So she was younger than all of you when she told me this. She told, and I remember it distinctly. I was five years old. She said, you can do anything that you put your mind to. And I was crazy enough to believe her. Okay? So I'm not done yet. I got lots of stuff to do, lots of stuff to, lots of hills to climb, lots of purpose to find. Okay? Luckily, I won't speak for everyone, but most of us in this room had an easier path and a, and a, and a uh, start that was further ahead than hers. But she figured it out, right? And she got where she wanted to go. She graduated, by the way, from um, the University of Minnesota, third in her class four years ago. She went back to school and did all that, and she just got her master's. Crazy, right? So she just kept, so all of that is instilled in me and Jake and, and in all of us. So that, that's, part of, that's part of our fuel, right? To seek out the best people, to continue to learn, and to figure out the best, the purpose that fills you, to define our success, to define who we are, regardless of what anyone else at that cocktail party, that dinner party, that wherever wants to define us. It's a curse and it's a trap. Don't let it happen to you. You can do anything that you want. All right?